tired of using regular blankets like Midi Hero? Do they somehow destroy your heating bills? Do you struggle when trying to figure out how to put them on? Are mundane tasks like answering the phone now impossibly difficult? Well, morons, now there's hope with the new What the F*** Blanket, the blanket that'll ruin your sex life. Now you can answer the phone with confidence. Awesome! Help Grandpa enjoy the O'Reilly Factor. Spoiler alert, Snape kills Dumbledore. Your dad will blog about how comfortable he is. I can't believe a black man's president. The What the F*** Blanket is made of the exact same materials regular blankets are but looks twice as retarded. Basically, it's a robe that you wear backwards. The what the f*** blanket will turn you into a complete shut-in that never leaves the house. So color a book, drink some tea, and hold a baby. You know, things you couldn't do with a regular blanket. And don't worry, one size fits all. So creepy dads can lie in a seductive pose. With the what the f*** blanket, you can take your dog and roast him on an open fire. Ruin your child's self-esteem and wear it in public. Sarah's not getting a date for the prom, look at her! So whether you're reading the obituaries, or viewing scrambled porn, or clogging your arteries, or telling a racist joke, you will look like a tool! Believe it or not, some dumbasses have paid as much as 60 bucks for the what the f*** blanket, which kinda makes me want to scream. Available in blueberry, mint, and blood flavors. Call now and receive a free... Flashlight? Why would you need a flashlight with your blanket? And she doesn't even need it. Look, you can see the text from here. She's reading it in broad daylight. What the hell? <sighs> Damn it. Side effects of the what the f blanket include but are not limited to heart failure, herpes, social awkwardness, never getting laid, looking like a dick, super herpes, the what the f blanket. Just, <sighs> just give up. Thank you.
the transition from becoming a fan to a wrestler is it's tough because you you're always a fan you should always be a fan just like I, i'm sure baseball players say the same thing and growing up in high school i didn't i didn't wrestle i, I played baseball i was a tall and skinny kid I never you know i always wanted to be a professional wrestler but i never thought that i would ever have the opportunity and then um I was approaching my 21st birthday and I went to a nightclub that let people that were 20 in and uh, I saw a wrestling poster and it said you know all these guys that I'd read about but it was like an independent show and at that point I had no idea what an independent show was I knew that there were smaller shows but if it wasn't in the magazine I didn't know it existed and at the bottom it said if if you want to become a professional wrestler called Dio's Dungeon and it had the phone number now I can barely remember my own phone number. You know, in today's iPhone things, you just click a button and everything like that. I still remember the phone number. 610-916-1238. And I called it and I, I, and I'm i like, uh, hi, my name's Steve Carino. Uh, I would like to become a professional wrestler. And the, the trainer at the says, well, there's a couple things you need to know. Do you have any experience? And I don't know what made me do it. I, 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 you know, to this day, I regret it. I had a magazine open and there was a um, an advertisement for Al Snow's wrestling school in Lima, Ohio. I go, yeah, I, I, I trained with Al Snow a little bit. And the guy's like, really? I'm a big fan of Al Snow's. And I'm thinking, oh, please don't call Al. And uh, yeah, so I, would, um, I went up there and I didn't know what to do. I, I knew wrestling was entertainment and I knew, you know, uh, from watching it for so long, like, okay, Maybe if I do this or if I try this or anything like that, I didn't know what like he was going to make me do what they were like the running, the squats, you know, amateur style wrestling. And I just went in there and I basically BS my way through that first day. The guy's like, oh, you're a natural. I could tell you're one of Al's students. I'm like, oh, yeah. And it, it took me, uh, you know, fast forwarding 18 years. Uh, I've seen Al Snow. I've wrestled Al Snow. And I've always, I can never look him in the eye. I'm always like, hey, how you doing? And then, yeah. So finally, um, he had asked me once, he goes, hey, there's this guy that says he was trained by you. And I'm like, here it comes. I go, no, I don't know him. I go, ridiculous, right? He goes, it's ridiculous that anybody would ever use uh, your name to get into wrestling school. I'm like, Al, I've been waiting to tell you this for almost 20 years now. He's like, no, no. He's like, I tell people I trained you now. He's like, you're successful. So he's like, I'll, I'll take the credit for it. So transitioning from a fan to a wrestler is tough because you're always learning you know and you're always a fan like i can watch wrestling now on on monday nights and become a fan again you know i'm not thinking about how the magic is made or is this guy get along with this guy behind the scenes i look at it as okay let let me see if i'm entertained as a fan so the transition's tough but it's if you you know, keep your feet on the ground it's easy um Talk about where your career went from there and, and what level you attained and where it's taken you around the world. I think the key to early success in wrestling was to make goals. Um, my, my original goal in wrestling was to have one match, you know, and uh, as crazy as it seems. Then after I had my one match, it was, oh man, I'd like to wrestle at my high school and you know be the returning hero i did that and then me i want to you know i want to win a championship you know i could always say that i was a champion once and you know i did that so i would literally every year write more goals and i had read an interview with paul Heyman once about he would give the guys the ball and it was their choice whether they would run through the line or would they fumble and i'm like that's a great way of thinking of things. Little did I know, you know, six years, five years later, he would become my boss. But I would, every opportunity I would get, I would just run through the line. You know, I don't care how small I was, how limited I was going to be. And I was just going to take the opportunity. I was going to have the best attitude. I was going to work the hardest. I was going to uh, do everything that every promoter asked me to do. And, you know, there, you have to eat a lot of a lot of dirt. I mean, you're you're putting up rings for ten bucks, you know, on a show in West Virginia, five hours away from home, and then wrestling the worst guy on the on the card and losing because you know this guy sold seven tickets. And um, but you know, I always did it with a smile on my face because I knew at the end of the day, like I had a goal. Um, 
on most guys, I would say 95% of the wrestlers that break in nowadays, their goal is to be a WWE superstar, and that's great. Me, from reading the magazines and tape trading in the early 80s, I wanted to be a star in Japan. And uh, when I, it took me almost seven years before I got my first tour of Japan. And within seven, within seven and a half years of making my debut, I was main eventing in, in Tokyo. And uh, to, that to me was just, you know, the icing on the cake. Anything more now is just, you know, uh, just fun. You know, I've, professional wrestling has taken me literally around the world. Uh, you know, for, as a kid that was born in Winnipeg and grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, you, you're not expected to do much. You're expected to work a full-time job, have your week vacation at the Jersey Shore, and, you know, live your life, have your 2.5 kids, and, you know... Um, Work, work, work at a uh, at a dairy, and that's what I did. My father did. My grandfather did, and it, it's good work, and it's it's stuff to be proud of. But professional wrestling allowed me the opportunity to. I've gone to Australia seven times. I've I've gone to England at least fifteen to seventeen times. Uh, I've been to Mexico. I've been to India. I've been to uh, Japan seventy nine times now. I, I've been all over Europe. It, it's one of those things where, you know, in fact getting a chance to come back to Winnipeg and, you know, on someone else's ticket, it's like a paid vacation. I get to see family and friends that I don't get to see all the time. And then I get to perform in the same city that I watched Hulk Hogan and Nick Bockwinkel wrestle in, you know? Yeah, you know, granted, I'm not wrestling at the, the Winnipeg Arena in front of 8,000 people, but it's still the same thing. You know, I get, in, I get into that ring and, and it's, the magic's there, you know. I get the the same goosebumps that I, I I've gotten for twenty years, and uh, that I got years before as a fan. So, it's it's one of those things where it's like this has been the greatest ride of the my entire life. And, and just when I think I'm about to slow down, something else pops up. You know, there there's a Pakistan tour that comes up, and you're like, oh, Pakistan, like, oh, but they hate Canadian Americans. But I'm going, you know. And it's 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 opportunities of uh, well, you know what? We don't want you in the ring and ring of honor anymore because we think you can talk and we you can be entertaining as a commentator and we're going to pay you X amount of dollars. I'm thinking, we that's more than I was making getting my head beat in. Like, and you want me to talk every week on TV? Like, where, do, where was this 20 years ago? I would have done this. Um, so it's just one of those ever-evolving things with, with professional wrestling and, and myself. And I've, I've just... I'm the luckiest guy in the entire world. Why was it important to you to succeed in the Japanese market instead of the North American market? I think because I, I to me, success in the United States was size-based. Growing up in the um, early 80s and the mid 80s, the, the WWF became a big man's company where the Hulk Hogan's, the Paul Orndorff, the Andre the Giants, the Big John Studs, they were all huge, I was small. Uh, I would get these tapes from Japan, uh, on these VHS tapes that I would I would trade with other wrestling fans, and I would get to see the smaller guys, the uh, the Kanemoto's, the Otani's, the Ultimo Dragons, um, Tiger Mask, Dynamite Kid. You would see all these light heavyweights and junior heavyweights, and I thought, wow, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. And then you would see how the fans would literally just sit there and and watch. It wasn't cheer, yay, boo. It was an appreciation for the, like, the art of wrestling. And I was, I was always um, interested in Japanese culture, wh whether it be you know, uh, everything from World War II on, everything before World War, you know, the, before World War II, the you know, industrialization of Japan. I was just always a big fan of the actual country of Japan. So to me, that was, that was my WrestleMania and that was my WWE to go over there and you know, and then when I became a heavyweight, you know, all the guys that I grew up watching, the Ricky Choshus, the Shinya Hashimoto's, the, um, the Antonio Inoki's, I, I thought, now I can compete against these guys. You know, these were my heroes that I would read. And I would, it sounds crazy because I can't read Japanese. I can speak it a little bit, but I can't read it. And I would get, uh, I would order Japanese wrestling magazines as a 12 year old kid from a store in Los Angeles. And they would come, <sighs> four or five months later. But I just always loved like the photography and how 
wrestling was taken so, so serious. And I also, going back to being a baseball fan, I would see every once in a while uh, an American or a Canadian baseball player that would go to Japan and just like revitalize their career. Warren Cromarty would be the, the best example of a guy that played for the Montreal Expos and was, you know, a subpar player, not too bad. He went to Japan and became a, not only a superstar, but like a, an actual star. He was in movies and magazines and, and commercials. And I thought, wow, I could be this guy. Like I could be this guy that could go over to Japan and, you know, be at a American Canadian over in Japan and I could come home and just be me and I thought wow what a great life that would be because to know me um, I'm a very socially awkward person you know my wife thinks it's the funniest thing in the entire world where I could be in front of 30 300 3,000 30,000 people with a microphone and I could you know insult this person do this person and wrestling my my underwear for 30 minutes and not think two things of it but you you put me at a at a party and I am, I got my glasses on, I'm hiding in the corner, how are you doing? Um, I think subconsciously Japan was a way of, I could be a star, but then when I'm home, I could be nerdy Steve Carino again. Did you reach that? Did you become what you wanted to become in Japan? Yeah, uh, becoming a star in Japan was, was difficult because coming over from the United States, they had a certain mindset of what you were. And, guys before have ruined it you know guys being disrespectful to fans or the press or the you know the other wrestlers and you know there's a there's a core of japanese wrestlers that still hate foreigners you know there's a core of japanese wrestlers and fans that hate foreigners go dating back from the war you know how maybe um their grandfather was in the war you know and the, there's still that uh the animosity I thought to myself, wow, you know what? If I'm gonna go over there, I'm gonna learn their style. I'm gonna learn their language. I'm gonna learn, uh, I wanna be one of them. And that's what I did. I would I would study, literally study on the bus, the, the Japanese language. I, um, you know, there it's, it was segregated a lot where American wrestlers would sit in the front, Japanese wrestlers would sit in the back of the bus. I would go and I would make my way into the, you know, I push my way through. Uh, I would go out drinking with all of them. And, you know, especially back 10, 12 years ago, Japanese and Americans weren't supposed to hang out in public, especially me being the big bad guy. I would want, I would want to hang out. I would go to the office and I would, you know, tell me what to do. Let me, let me help. I want to help. Okay. So I would become friends with everybody and then the press would see this. And then, and it would be funny because I would be a bad guy in the ring, but they would always say, ah, oh, he's a bad guy in the ring, but gentlemen yeah like where we developed this character whereas i couldn't understand why people would boo me because i was friends with everybody and i love japanese people and i love yeah you know, but i would take that shortcut where i would punch the guy in the eye or i would hit him low and when they would boo i'd be like why that, that I, i'm just doing what i wanted to do yeah and it became fun because i would become popular but they would boo in the right spots and they would cheer in the right spots and um <laughs> I always say you always have that a whole friend, right? That guy that's, you know, he's a jerk, but he's still my friend. And that's how I became uh, popular in Japan is because I would hang out with all the good guy Japanese wrestlers and they would all say the same thing. Mm, he's a jerk, but he's our jerk. Yeah. And I would drink with them and oh, I would do everything. You know, I would, I, I had a Japanese girlfriend for a while. I really became part of the culture and I think I think that's what helped me become um, a drawing card for them because fans knew at the end of the day I was the bad guy but I respected Japanese uh, wrestlers fans and the culture and at the end of the day you wanted me to get beat up but you really didn't want to because you know I was <coughs> excuse me I was one of them were you always a, a villain over there I was a villain for 77 of 79 tours. And it's crazy because the fans were ready. You know, I'll remember it, you know, like it was yesterday. I was wrestling Mark Coleman, who was an um, American Olympian in wrestling in 2000. And also, <clears throat> he was uh, one of the first UFC mainstream fighters. But he would come over to Japan and he would fight for Pride, um, which was the 
the, the predecessor of UFC. And uh, they they finally changed me to the to the fan favorite, and it was amazing. I literally sold a hundred T-shirts the first the first night in, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I'm making all this money. The crowd is cheering for me, because it, now it was all right. Instead of cheering me to the ring and then booing me for the 15 minutes I was in the ring, now they could cheer for me the whole time. And I remember my first match as a good guy in Japan was against Mark Coleman. I'm thinking, ah. Oh, I'm going to get massacred. This guy is, you know, he's the real deal, UFC, you know, Olympic wrestler and stuff like that. And the, the crowd was so hot for me. And uh, I pulled out the victory. And you would have thought, like, I just won the championship. I was I was a big hero. Three weeks later, I'm back on, on tour. And they go, ah, oh, today you change. I go, no! And I can remember that being the only time... I was ever angry about going back to the villain because being a wrestling fan, you know, since I was eight years old and being insecure, I've always wanted to be the villain. I've always wanted to be that guy that people booed and I, I would take the cheap shot and I could say bad things about their mothers on the microphone. And, you know, and in Japan, I could, for those first couple years I could you know I could say bad things in Japanese and they'd be like oh, oh I can't believe you would say that and now here here I was finally the hero and I was accepted and I was, I was so excited I was so mad and uh, I remember I acted like a child I said yeah well I don't want to be a villain and my boss Hashimoto goes well you're a good villain I go yeah you know what you're an awful hero I go I don't believe in you anymore and I slam the door and I remember thinking that was the worst argument ever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I went back and people, like when I changed back the villain, they didn't accept it right away. And like, I could feel that. And uh, I remember like, they didn't boo as much as uh, I wanted them to. And I walked in the locker room, I looked at uh, my boss, I go, that didn't work. He goes, because you didn't want it to work. He's like, you are half-ass bad guy. I go, yeah, you're half-ass good guy. And I closed the door again, I'm like, that was the second worst argument I've ever done. Um, so now when I go back, I'm more the legendary heel or a legendary villain where it's like, we're going to cheer him because he's been here for so long, but he's going to do everything he can to get booed and we're going to have fun with it. And we're going to say bad things to him so that he'll come out and try and fight us. But you know, uh, at the end of the day, they're always up at my table, shaking hands, telling me, Oh, Crimson tonight, go out beer. Uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I now have that rapport with the fans where it's like, okay, for 20 minutes, you're gonna boo me. But the end of the, after that match is over, we're all gonna go get beer together. So it, it becomes fun. Tell me uh, about highlights of your career in Japan. Hang on, just a sec. Yeah, highlights of your career in Japan. After 79 tours, you, you end up with a lot of highlights, you know, or a lot of lowlights. Highlights in, in my career in Japan definitely have to be uh, main eventing Ryogoku Sumo Hall in front of 10,500 people. That was just absolutely amazing because um, Sumo Hall is, you know, such an old building that was made for sumo wrestling. And, uh, you know, every once in a while they'll have the pro wrestling events on it. To, to be standing in the middle of the ring, you know, at main event time and I'm that guy, that... It was, it was absolutely crazy. Um, Corkin Hall, which is the smaller building in Tokyo that every company has shows at. I had, in 79 tours, I had wrestled there 94 times, main eventing 48 times, selling out 48 times. So it, it was the one of the cooler things is that every time I was the main event, I sold out. And like, it, it, like ego driven. It, it's one of those things where you like look around and you're like, main event? packed house wow this was great but you know just um winning championships over there i won seven different championships in in japan which is always you know such a great thing and tag team wrestling is so big there you know winning uh, the nwa intercontinental tag team T championship with cw anderson uh, who's been my partner since 1996 uh, you know standing in the middle of cork and hall and you know we're holding these two gold belts and we're like wow this is this is what we did, you know? And like afterwards, we're like, what do we do? We're like, let's go celebrate. And you no know, wrestling's entertainment. 
the crowd makes you feel and the style makes you feel so good that like we were at a steakhouse uh, later that night with our championship belts on the table fans are coming over taking pictures and buying us beer it was like a huge celebration but another highlight maybe even bigger than wrestling at Ryogoku was you know wrestling my heroes Ricky Choshu, Shinya Hashimoto, Toshiaka Kawada, uh, Misawa, um, you know, all these guys that I grew up watching and tape trading and watching and stuff like that. Now all of a sudden I'm in the ring with them and they're not treating me like the, the foreigner. They're treating me like this guy belongs with us and this guy is here to do good business. And you know, they, they would end up treating me like more like a friend than a guy that's just coming over to make money and, you know, have good matches. You know, I, I, I definitely felt accepted over there. And that probably was one of the, the greatest highlights of, of my career of being, being accepted by your peers, especially in, you know, not only a different country, a different continent. Is there a different style of wrestling there? Is it unlike what we typically see on TV in North America? The styles between like American style wrestling and Japanese style are, is apples and oranges. It's all pro wrestling, but I believe pro wrestling has a huge mix of different styles where American wrestling is based on entertainment. You know, the, the good body, the cosmetic look, whereas Japanese wrestling is built on samurai spirit and sumo, sumo wrestling spirit, which means that never say die. So it's, it's a def definitely a different style, very stiff, because fans may know it's entertainment, but they don't want to know it during that match. So you're, you're getting hit harder and you're getting slapped and you're being dropped on your head more. Um, there's more action at the end of the match where they call them false finishes where you might have three finishing moves and the guy may kick out all three, but then you hit a combination of all three where they finally go down. And, you know, Americans will watch it and be like, oh, I don't understand that. Like, why, why, did that, why was that guy Superman? And what they don't realize, it's not Superman. It's that kamikaze never say die until you're dead. You know, you, you're, you're a hero for just putting up the good fight. And I love that style. It's, you know, it's, you know, there's more clean finishes. There's not as many disqualifications or count out of the rings. And it, it's more of you go to a pinfall or submission finish, but both wrestlers look good. The guy that got beat looks great because he looks strong beat and, and he fought a good fight because he, you know, he kicked out of this submission or, you know, he he did everything he could to, you know, block that that lariat three times before eating it for the final one. It's like, you know, he fought the good fight. And to me, that that to me is professional wrestling because, it, yeah, if you watch it, it's such drama, you know, because you never really know where the finish is going to come. In, the, in American wrestling, you know, when John Cena hits the attitude adjustment, that's it. No one kicks out of that. And if they do, it better be WrestleMania or, you know, people aren't going to believe it. Uh, not that American wrestling isn't good. I, I, I love it and I enjoy it, but the Japanese strong style, they call it, and King's Road style, is based on that samurai, you know, fight to the finish. And that, to me, is, that's the drama and emotion that I, I love as a fan. Talk about um, your career in North America and, and how far you went and what you thought of it. When we talk about my career in North America, I always like to equate my career as being Crash Davis from Bull Durham. A career minor leaguer that made it to the, the, the big time for a little cup of coffee, but he was always a triple A ball player. Not that that you know, he made money, he made, you know, uh, he held titles, he did, you know, all the all broke records and stuff like that, but he could just never be the top guy. That was me in North America. You know, I, I broke into ECW in 19, late 1998, then early 1999, became ECW world champion in 2000. Uh, but from then on, I went, I decided that I wanted to make my focus in Japan, where now then in North America, I became the headliner that was on national TV, but also the guy that wasn't on the WWE's radar because they knew that I was, a Japanese wrestler that's where I wanted to be but also on the other hand the offers weren't there because I didn't really have the cosmetic look I had more of that I'm gonna eat I'm gonna you know I'm gonna train hard but I'm also you know 
not going to be cut up like a like a Randy Orton or a, you know or a Ryback or a John Cena and stuff like that. And they were looking for a cosmetic. They're looking for that cosmetic type wrestler, which is good. But um, so in North America, I became that guy. Whereas I could headline every independent show in Canada and in the states and draw what they wanted me to draw and. I had the willingness to wrestle the top guy and not worry about who's going to win or who's going to lose. Or, you know, I was I was always willing to, if there was five shows attached to a, a deal, you know, okay, I'll cut my price a little bit. But they, they knew that I wasn't going to come in and do five minutes and be that guy. Well, I'm not losing and I'm doing only doing five minutes in the ring and I I want my own locker room. I believe that. When I'm brought to an independent show, my job is to help that top guy out get to the next level, to be with the level that I was at, where I can make money and I sell my T-shirts and you know I'm uh, I'm not above being the, the carnival type, you know, the gypsy that's going to from town to town to town, but that's going to be my legacy. I'm always going to be that independent guy. I'm going to be uh, this generation's Terry Funk, where Terry Funk was. He'd have his cup of coffee here and his cup of coffee there, but he was the world heavyweight champion in the NWA, and he was the world heavyweight champion in ECW. But for the most part, he was an outlaw. He would wrestle in Winnipeg one night, in Fort Lauderdale the next night, in Nashville the next night. That's me. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the last of the real outlaws. I was the ECW world champion. I was the NWA world champion. But still, I'm that guy that will go and headline in Winnipeg on a Saturday, Fort Lauderdale on a Sunday, do it all again next next week and go Friday in Nashville, Saturday in Los Angeles, Sunday in Dallas. You know what I mean? So I'm not stuck to one company per se as, as opposed to I'm, I'm that guy that you call upon when you need that good match, you need that emotion brought out, that and... Uh, and the guy that's going to be good to fans too, you know, I'm, I'm not, you don't have to worry about me, you know, uh, you know, being that guy that's going to be all strung out on drugs or that guy that's going to be unreliable or that guy that's going to be dangerous in the ring. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm basically my, my MO in North America and they'll put it on my, my gravestone is I was the go-to guy. Where did, um, the name King of Old School come from and... What was that all about? Monikers in wrestling are as old as you know wrestling itself. Uh, when I first got into wrestling, I wanted to be Lightning Steve Carino. You know, I was going to be fast, and it was going to be that. Uh, one of my trainers, his name was King Kalu, and King Kalu is one of the greatest men that you'll ever meet. Here's a guy that, um, unfortunately. And he would never say unfortunately, but unfortunately, um, he was he was given he was dealt the cards of he has two mentally handicapped kids, so he had a choice: do I pursue wrestling on a national level, and he was amazing, still is amazing in the ring, or do I find something close to home, take care of my children, take care of my wife, and you know wrestle independently, and that's what he chose. And never once would you hear him regret his decision, um, you know, blame anything, blame anybody, blame the doctors, blame uh, anything for what he was been given. And I always thought, man, if I could make it to the national level, you know, I want to be a guy like King Kalua, I, I, you know. And um, my, my style was an old school style growing up in the 80s and loving those guys. Even though I was tall and thin, I wasn't the big high flyer that I thought I was going to be. I thought, wow, if I'm going to, if I'm going to stand out from all these high flyers, I'm going to be the ground attack, and I'm going to have to do that, and I'm going to say that I'm from the old school where we didn't used to fly, even though I loved it. Um, and we were putting together names in ECW when I first started, and uh, the first thing I pitched was, I want to be the king of old school this generation's king as King Kahlua and you know as old school and Paul Heyman who had known King Kahlua and totally respected my idea said I don't think so because Jerry Lawler's the king and he once sued Vince McMahon because of King Harley race and he's like we don't need that six months later I was Mr. Old School and uh, one night Joey Styles, the, the commentator for ECW was mad at Paul Heyman on pay-per-view and says, that's Steve Carino. He's not just Mr. Old School. He's the king of old school. And uh, 
that quick, Steve Carino became the king of old school. And it stuck. You know, not only was I Mr. Old School, I was the king of old school. I was I was the leader of this generation's old school, you know, mentality. And it stuck, you know, for for years. And it, it, it's so funny, you know, ECW was 13, 14 years ago. You know, guys see me and, you know, young guys are, you know, they always come up. They're like, King, how you doing? I'm like, oh, that is so cool. Like, it's not Sir. It's not Steve. It's not Mr. Karina. It's King, you know, King, how you doing? And I always, I always think of King Kalua. You know, he, you know, here's a guy that didn't have to be nice to me, he didn't have to mentor me, and he didn't have to uh, help train me. But he did. You know, he had other things going on, and he helped me. And you know, for me to carry on, you know, for wrestling fans to think King of Old School is like I'm carrying on that old school tradition. For me, I think it's it's more of a dedication to King Kalua. Is like I'm the next king. You know, and and I'm going to do everything the way he would have done it. Uh, let's talk about Kathy and Steve's careers a little bit. I have been fortunate enough to be the... Colby's career, sorry. Yeah, don't worry. Um, that's what I figured you were talking about. I've been lucky enough to be the first of a family, you know, where I grew up in a, a days where the Hart family, you know, there was Stu Hart, but then there was Brett and Owen and Keith and Smith and Bruce. And then there was the Von Erics, there was Fritz. But then there was Kevin and Carrie and David and Michael. Uh, you know, there's families have all gone through wrestling and stuff like that, but never in a million years did I think that I would be the start of my family in wrestling. Uh, my sister Kathy, who was born in Winnipeg, uh, created a niche for herself as Alice in Danger, starting in, in 1999 or 2000, might have been 2000. She wanted to get into wrestling, and she was not a huge fan growing up, but she loved the theatrical aspect of it. And she got a chance to be a manager on a show in Reading, Pennsylvania, and she didn't have a name. They're like, oh, well, think of a name real quick. She goes, Allison, which is her middle name. So afterwards, she's like, I really want to do this. I go, but you just can't be Allison. I go, what are you, Cher, Madonna? I go, what do you want to be? And I go, she goes, I don't know. She's like, this wrestling's so dangerous though. I go, oh, I go, what about Allison Danger? She's like, I love it. And for the first three years we were in wrestling together, we never told anybody we were brother and sister. And because it was in her mind that if people knew that she was Kathy Carino, they'd be like, they would either give her too many opportunities that she wasn't ready for, or if they didn't like me, they would push me down, push her down. So she wanted to make her name on her own. So, uh, and to this day, people will still be like, are you guys really brother and sister? Is that like a story? And we always laugh about it. And then a few years ago, uh, my son Colby um, wanted to do some like charity matches and being young, you know, it's just like, okay, let's do this and let's do that. But in Pennsylvania, you have to be 18 to wrestle. And there was a show that we were at and they were one wrestler down. And I'm like, oh, and the commission wasn't there. and. I just happened to have a tiger mask in my, in my bag. I go, what about Colby? I go, he can wrestle a little bit. You know, why don't we put him under a mask and make him American tiger? And they're like, oh, that's a good idea. Not knowing that he was going to go out and do flips and this and dive. And he's a good amateur wrestler in high school. And all of a sudden people were like asking him at the end of the show, Hey, can you wrestle on my show? And can you do this? And all of a sudden he became American tiger. And now uh, we had asked New Japan Pro Wrestling real quick because Tiger Mask is a big character over there. We said, hey, look, Colby's doing this American Tiger thing. We just, we, we're not asking your permission because he's not saying he's Tiger Mask, but you know, we just want you to know what we're doing. They said, oh, Kuhn-san, what is your address? I'm like, oh, here it comes. Here's the cease and desist. Within five days, they sent him a real Tiger Mask with an American logo on the back. They said, please enjoy. So he developed more stuff and he, you know, him being an amateur wrestler and he would go to all these shows with me and he would roll around in the, in the ring before and he would learn and do all these seminars. And then all of a sudden he said, he goes, I want to make this character my own. So he got a new costume, brand new custom made masks and stuff like that. And uh, now he's involved. And it's so funny because I'll go into a locker room now that he's 17 I go into a locker room and he goes with the young guys and I go with the older guys and I, he's no longer my son. He's 
American Tiger. And I find it funny because fans know he's who he is. But when his music comes on and he's in the ring and he's got that mask on, he's American Tiger. And it, it's so funny being at a show with my sister Kathy, my son Colby. People will walk up and they'll be like, hi, King. Hi, Danger. Hi, Tiger. Yeah. And it's just so surreal to think like, man, every day is Halloween in the Carino house, you know? And, you know, my my mother, uh, and it's funny, you, you would think like my mother... Nickname would be after me. Nope, she's Mama Danger because she went to more shows with my sister than she did with me. So it's like people run into me and uh, they'll be like, other wrestlers will be like, oh my goodness, I saw Mama Danger last week. And you'd be like, <laughs> so it's become a real like family affair. And this, for this Mother's Day, my mother in law, who's an amazing, amazing person, works in a screen printing uh, uh, Place, and she made my mo- mother a shirt that said uh, Carino Wrestling Family and on the back it said Alice in Danger, King of Old School Steve Carino, American Tiger, Aris who is uh, my sister's husband who is actually a wrestler from Switzerland so it's like we have this whole all of a sudden we have this wrestling family and it's like wow now it's you know 20 years from now hopefully you're reading about the Hearts, the Von Erics the um, you know all these different wrestling names the Guerreros and Maybe it's the Carinos, and it's it it makes it a lot of fun. Kathy still wrestling? My sister uh, spent thirteen years wrestling, just retired. Um, it got to a point where she was starting to have problems with uh, neurological problems from too many concussions, um, which is crazy because I think I've had more than her, but I'm still still kicking. But she had suffered a minor stroke uh, about. November of 2012 and it scared her enough to be like you know what I'm a mother you know I have a good job in La- I live in Las Vegas I've done everything that I've wanted to do maybe it's time for me to go but she's still involved she is a, a assistant producer for Shimmer Wrestling out of Chicago which is the the biggest women's wrestling group in the United States and, and Canada so she helps out and she's a writer for them she you know uh, she writes the formats for the the DVDs she She's the boss of the girls, and she's tough. She's four years younger than me, but everybody thinks that she's the older sister because me, I'm very laid back. I go in the locker room. I have fun. I like to tell stories, BS with the guys. When Alice in Danger's in the locker room, everybody's, she'll tell you what to do, how much time to do it, and if you don't do it, oh, you're going to hear about it. People will look at me. I'll be like, I don't know. She's always been like this. Yeah, she's the militant one of the, the family. So I'll check time on this card here. Good. Okay. Um, today you're in at one o'clock in the afternoon. You wrote the next morning at five something. This has got to be a bit of a grind when you do tours like this. So I guess my question is, why are you still doing this? The question I get a lot is, why do you still do this after almost twenty years? And you're not going to wrestle at WrestleMania. You're the chances of you becoming a performer on TNA or even being back into an in-ring performer in Ring of Honor on national TV is rare. Why do you still do it? Man, I'll tell you what, getting up at 2.30 in the morning to drive to the airport to get on a 50-seat plane to fly from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Atlanta, switch over and go from Atlanta to Minneapolis, switch over again, go on another 50 seat plane from uh, Minneapolis to Winnipeg, get get here at one o'clock, um, check into your hotel, try to get a little bit of fast food, try to get a quick nap, go do your, your match, and then be back on that same plane at 525 the next morning to go home to uh, a pregnant wife, you know, and things to do at home and then you know to work all week and then you know you got to go into the gym and you got to do this and you got to do that man it's that 15 minutes that i get in the ring and that i get to perform and i get to hear the fans cheer and boo and you know i'm I'm that schizophrenic guy where it's depending on where i'm at i could be cheered one night i could be booed the next night that to me is the greatest drug in the entire world being able to travel to these cities whether it be Winnipeg or Fort Lauderdale or Atlanta or you know or Dallas or Los Angeles, 
and still be looked upon as a guy that they so the fans want to see and the fans want to buy pictures and t-shirts or tell me about a match that they've seen 15 years ago that makes it all worth it that makes it worth it when i am you know sucking on a cup of starbucks coffee walking through the airport hoping that man did i did i change my underwear or am i wearing the same underwear again oh it really doesn't matter because you know i'm on a plane no one sees me um it, it's the the grind of getting hurt of coming back to a hotel room at one o'clock in the morning knowing i gotta leave at three and taking that shower and and <laughs> it sounds awful but putting an ice pack on my shoulder putting one on my elbow putting two on my knees god i hope there's something good on tv for this you know a little bit oh man i'm you know you're down and you're eating beefaroni out of a uh, out of a little can because it's the only thing that was open this lifestyle if you wrote it down and you told people about it you would think that you, you know it's absolutely crazy but it's the coolest lifestyle in the entire world man because just 33 years ago or 32 years ago i was that kid in front of the television watching tommy wildfire rich tell me to come to the atlanta omni because he's going fired up on buzz sawyer and i'm that guy now i'm that guy that's going town to town and yeah i'm living out of a suitcase and i'm you know and i'm wrestling and i'm i'm you know drinking beer with people i don't know and you know i'm leading that gypsy lifestyle you know only to go home and you know i miss my wife and my son and you know our soon to be born baby i'm i mean i want to go home and i go home and i'm i love being home but then i'm like it's time to go back on the road and do my thing and um I do, and I'm going to do it for as long as I can until the, the legs don't work anymore. And, and I basically think that once the people say, it's time to go, okay, it's time to go. And then I can walk away. Uh, in Ring of Honor, I can't do half the stuff that these young 23, 24, 25 year old guys can do in the ring, but I can contribute on commentary and I can contribute helping guys put together matches in the back and stuff like that. So uh, always be involved and you know what? Every day is something different. It's never the same. That's the funny part. I can come to Winnipeg two times or three times a year and I'm sure something will, it won't be the same. I won't look and go, oh, here again. Every town is different. You know, every locker room is different. Every personality is different. And that's what keeps me going. It's, it's, it's still the most fun job I've ever had. Is it going to take someone coming up to you and saying, Steve, it's time, you're done, or will you recognize it yourself, do you think? When it comes time to go, I already think it's time to go for me, you know, because I've done everything that I possibly can do. There, there's nothing more in the ring for me to accomplish. Um, I've wrestled all my heroes. I've wrestled in some of the greatest arenas in the entire world. Uh, I'll never wrestle at a WrestleMania, but I have wrestled at Madison Square Garden for the WWE. I mean, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where I'm ready to go. I'm ready to say, okay, maybe it's time to hang up the boots. But no one said it to me yet. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. I'm waiting for that guy to say, look, I don't think it's, this is what we, people don't want to see you in. People don't want you to be in the ring. The wrestlers are scared that you're going to slow them down. And I'm always worried about it. I'm always worried about it. Oh, man, Kenny Omega is so good and quick. And then he'll come up to me and be like, I'm so glad we're wrestling each other tonight. I'd be like, you're a Kenny Omega. You're like top guy in Japan right now. And I'm the older guy. What, why do you want to wrestle me? And I think, well, maybe it's what it was 20 years ago when I wanted to wrestle Greg the Hammer Valentine. Or I wanted to wrestle... Um, you know, the honky tonk man and all these guys. Sure, they're slower and older, but they're still Greg the Hammer Valentine. They're still the honky tonk man. I, st I still think I have a little bit of that name value where it's like, you know what? I grew up watching Steve Carino and now I do want to wrestle him and see how much fun it'll be and, you know, how much, you know, he's still got it. Let me see if I can push him to that, that one last great match. And um, we're in Ring of Honor. They, they basically told me like, hey, look, you're older now and we don't want to see you get hurt, but we also want you to be around and we also want you to be on commentary. And it's like, I think they thought I would be offended by it. I'm like, no way, I'm ready. Let, let's do this. Let's, you know, let's have fun. It gets to the point where now they're like, do you mind having a match? I'll be like, well, 
you know, there's so many good young guys out there I think that could uh, benefit from this match. Let me manage them, you know? And so it's still, it's still the fun of going out there and doing it. But it, there's going to come a time where the book's going to be open one, and one or two weekends a month and then three weekends a month and then four weekends a month. And then I'm only pulling the boots out five times a year. Um, but I'm, I'm never going to be upset about that because... For 20 years, I've been doing this so many times a year, you know, 150 times a year, that I've done everything that I can do. What more can I do? Maybe, maybe it is time to slow down, and I'll be ready when they tell me. So someone's gonna have to tell you. Someone's definitely gonna have to tell me. I'm gonna have to pry these boots off me. No, I don't want to be. I don't want to be Ric Flair where I've hung around too li- too long. I want to be still welcome, you know what I mean? And I've never begged for work. I've never emailed a promoter and said, hey, I am Steve Carino and I could do this and I could do that. Every once in a while, I'll have an open date that comes up. I'll put it on my Twitter. September 28th, this become available. Who wants it? And that quick, somebody will email me. Hey, what's your rate? What can we do here? Uh, Oh, awesome. You know what I mean? I've never had to beg for work. And I've never wanted to be that guy that's going to beg for work. So it's it's... When I have an an open weekend, I cherish it, you know, because it's a weekend with my wife. It's a weekend with my son. Um, I have a son upcoming. You know, it's going to be a weekend with him. And uh, I'm just going to enjoy it. Yeah, so it's once the booking stop happening, I'm not going to be like, well, what about me? I'm going to be like, okay, what's the next chapter? I watched you very closely in the locker room backstage. And I... I noticed how other wrestlers love to sit with you and listen to your stories, but I also see a, a great look of admiration in their eye. How, when you're done, would you like to be remembered? What would you like people to say about Steve Carino? When it's all said and done, and they're writing the book of Steve Carino, and they say, you know, this guy did this, and this guy did that, and this guy drew money here, and he didn't do this. Uh, and they're going to ask me, how would you want to be remembered? Basically, it's easy. I want to be remembered as a guy that loved every moment that I had in professional wrestling. And there's an old saying, you either make millions of dollars or you make millions of memories. And I have millions of memories. And being in a locker room, especially an independent locker room with a lot of guys that know, they know it, that they're never going to be a WWE type wrestler. But then they'll look at me and they'll go, you know what, Steve Carino made a living without the WWE, without WrestleMania. And he did okay. And he's got millions of memories. He's got millions of these crazy stories that are true. And I can do that. And I think if it's not admiration, it's a it's a inspiration to guys that know that they're never gonna make millions of dollars or have endorsements or be on national TV, but they know that they can go out there and live their dream. You know, I lived my dream the first moment I had that first match. You know, everything else is just a continuation of the the best dream that you could ever have. And I, I think that maybe guys could look at me as an inspiration of, hey, you don't always have to be the main event of WrestleMania to be successful. Success is in the eyes of you know the person looking at you in the mirror. If you're happy with what you've done over your time, whether it's five matches or whether it's 35 years on the independent circuit, you know, or the, the minor leagues, you know, as long as you're happy at the end of the day and you've done what you wanted and you've lived the life that you have set out to live, then man, you know, you 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 succeeded. I, I believe that failure is when you don't try. And you know, I, I've failed many times, you know, should I have tried to go to the WWE when I was 28? Probably, but you know what? I got the main event in, in Japan. I got to travel to Australia and England and Europe and all these different things. And it made me who I am today. Whereas somebody else at 28 could be like, no way, I don't want to live that lifestyle that Karina led. And I want to try for the WWE. Who succeeds? Who succeeds? Who fails? No one. No one fails because everybody's following their own path. 